Hello, welcome to another parallel project training podcast on the APM PMQ syllabus that's launching in September 2024. My name is Ruth Burks and I'm here with one of our senior trainers, Carmen Campos. Today we're going to be talking about budgeting and cost control. Welcome, Carmen. Hello. If we look at the APM syllabus, the learning objective is to understand budgeting and cost control as the ability to estimate costs develop and agree budgets and monitor actual costs against forecast costs. There's quite a lot in here and it really does take us from the beginning to the end of a project. We've got a number of different learning outcomes. So let's take each one of those in turn and Carmen, you can talk us through how we can do this successfully on our project. The first learning outcome is to know how to create a budget and to understand about the different costs that will be included in a budget. So Carmen, tell me, what what is a budget? Why do we need one? And how do we go about uh, creating one? Let's go from the start. So budget is the estimation of the cost that the project is planning to spend through the life cycle. So budgeting is about establishing how much money the project will require. To do that, you need to start with estimating all the costs that the project will require to complete the full scope. And in linear projects in particular, you do that at the start. Um, okay. for, for the whole project, you, you need to have a well-defined scope. You need to consider what resources you will require, both labor and, and non-labor. You need to consider the methods that you're going to use to estimate the cost. And we have another podcast where we will talk about different methods. You need to understand different type of costs. You need to understand what assumptions you make. And if you take all these considerations into account, including the consideration that some people is more optimistic than others, some people suffer from over-optimism and there is a lot of bias. So once all of these considerations are taken into account, then the estimates can be better understood and and validated. It it strikes me as if this is something that our project manager needs to be quite skilled at creating a budget because there's a lot of detail involved. You you talked about different costs and breaking things down. What what are the different types of costs that we might need to consider when we're putting our budget together? So some of the costs may be fixed. Fixed costs are things that will be incurred even if you don't produce anything. For example, if you need to pay insurance, on the other hand, there are some costs that depends on how much work or how much product you produce. These are variable costs. For example, if you're doing a project to build a new rail line, the longer the rail line is, the more materials you need. Materials right. are a perfect example of a variable yeah. cost. So maybe the insurance to protect the workers on your rail line, that would be a fixed cost. But the variable yes. cost would be how much material they use, how much steel you need. Talking about people working on the rail line, would you say that labour is fixed or variable? That is a really good question. Labour, if you produce a longer rail line, you're going to spend more time of people building it. However... If you don't produce any work and they have been contracted for the project, for example, Mm -hmm. you may still need to to pay their wages. So that is an interesting one because I will say it's semi-variable. Yeah. Do you think? It's a really interesting one. It also goes back to the, the, the contract that the, the, the people are working under. If this has been purchased on a fixed price, we could see it's more fixed. If it's on a time and materials, it becomes exactly. one of those variable costs. So the PM needs to consider fixed costs, variable costs. Yeah. The PM needs to know if the cost will be a reoccurring cost. So, okay. for example, if you have a software license, it's okay. going to be paid every month or non-reoccurring. So if you just buy new equipment for your project, you will have upfront set up right. costs and yeah. that's it. The project manager also needs to know if the costs are direct costs to the project or the costs are indirect. So they may be costs that are associated with operating the output of the business as a whole. I can see the direct costs. But what about indirect costs? Can you give me an example of that? So indirect costs could just be the the renting of the unit if Uh the unit is being used for the organization. So it's a lot of different costs and considerations to be taken into account. So I'm I'm the project manager then. I'm I'm at the beginning of my project. I need to get all of this information together for my budget. What's the best way of capturing all of this, of pulling all of this together? The most commonly used tool is a cost breakdown structure. So it's the most recognizable for every project manager. It's a tool that 
identifies all the different cost categories associated with the different work packages in the work breakdown structure. And it really emphasized the need of having a very good, well-defined scope because yeah. you could use the cost breakdown structure against each of these work packages to collect, record, and later on in the project to monitor and control that as part yeah. of your financial reporting. You mentioned that it's really important to have a well-defined scope to be able to do that. So how does this work if we're working on an iterative project lifecycle where we don't have that well-defined scope up front? What do we do then? So what we do is we look at the high-level functionality of the product and then you look at the duration of your sprint and the resources allocated to that sprint. So it's going to be a fix because yeah. the flexibility is on the scope, the priority of the requirements. So the way resources are allocated to that iterative project will determine the fixed cost of the iteration. I see how that works. So this cost breakdown structure will only apply to linear projects yeah. where we are deriving the cost based on the scope to complete and the work to complete that scope. Yeah. So yeah. that level of detail is a bit too much for agile projects. In linear projects, you also use your cost breakdown structure to as assign financial codings. Most people listening to us today will probably have cost codes. People yeah. know if they need to book their hours, they book it to one cost code. If you need to book costs on materials, it goes to a different code. So that sometimes is set up as part of the organizational yes. level. Yeah, the, the project has to align with organizational financial procedures. Exactly. Okay. I've used the cost breakdown structure, the CBS. I, I understand the different types of costs involved in my project and I've, I've come to that overall cost for the uh, project. That set me up well, but that's not going to be enough to control things on my project, is it? What, what do I need to do now once I've got that overall cost? So what we've done so far, as you said, it gives us the total figure. So now we have a total budget. This project is going to be um, one and a half million but we need to really see where the costs fall over time because from an organization point of view, they need to know when the money is going to be required yeah. throughout the life cycle. It's very important for the project manager to do a cumulative curve of the cost over the time period because that is going to give you a good baseline for your cash flow forecasting yeah. to see this is what we plan to spend these months and this is what we plan to spend over the coming months. That really helps the organization to know when these funding drawdowns are, are required. If your project has got quite a, a large budget, significant maybe within the organizational finances, then it's important to make sure that you're keeping an eye on that cash flow and that we're not expecting that 1.5 million to come in all at the same time. Exactly. And um, this is why the importance between fixed and variable costs is, is really key. So now we have a full estimate. We know when the funding is going to be needed. So we need to get agreement now. We need to remember that the budget is not just an estimate. The budget now needs to take into account things like contingency. We need to consider any other efforts spread across the other areas of the business that have not been taken into account and then you go and gain approval from a sponsor from the senior management team there will also be agreement about when that funding is released and we talked very briefly earlier in project that are linear life cycle that would be at the various decision gates in iterative projects the funds may be released more frequently maybe on every iteration. So let's suppose that we have our project, we have the estimates, we establish the budget and we got agreement. Happy yeah. days. Fantastic. That's quite a lot of work that we've already done, but we're still in early stages of our project here, aren't we? People underestimate sometimes this step. It's very key to have some solid estimates and, and try to have a very well thought through budget because it's going to make life easier later on in the project. We've talked about everything against learning outcome A on the syllabus. What about now thinking about forecasting, refining budgets and using uh, cost control techniques? Um, we'll talk a little bit about earned value. Cost in particular is one of the constraints that could easily go off on a spiral. Some people call it the runaway train because it could easily get going very quickly off, off the track. So having yeah. to 
think about that in advance is very useful. Really being on top of your budget across the, the project life cycle actually feeds into risk management. You were talking about how we might release the budget against gate reviews or per time box in an iterative project. All of that feeds into the risk management as well, that we're protecting that budget. And the- this is why, again, back to the PM, um, PM need to monitor and just get on top of the costs, not only the costs that have been paid, but also costs that may have been accrued because the last thing you want is is your watermelon project where everything is okay and then all of a sudden something comes later, something is invoiced 30 or 60 days later. It's like here in the UK, we said, oh, it's not been rain, not rain for six months and all of a sudden the storm comes. There are different ways to track the project. So PM may use different tools and techniques, um, earn value management, may track that on spreadsheets. Some people use a Microsoft project to track labor costs. Some people have a capacity planning built into that. Using corporate systems, SAP, Oracle. So there are different ways of doing it. But the most important, regardless what system you use, is to evaluate how that cost data relates to your project objectives and your progress. Because if you do that, then you will have a good indication as to whether we are on track or not. Spending less money that we plan, that doesn't mean that the project is performing well. It may just means we're not spending money because we've not done anything. Yes. Oh, what yeah. haven't we done if we haven't spent the money? Exactly. So this is why earned value management is probably one of the main tools that projects use to track whether the project is progressing efficiently or or not. That's one of the, the techniques that's mentioned in the syllabus. So for people that haven't heard of earned value or haven't used this before, what is it and, and how does it work? So in very, very simple terms, end value is just a measure of the value of the work that has been completed. So for example, if I have to fit 10 doors in my house and I have a budget of £1,000, if my reporting period is every day, I'm reporting to my husband every day on, on progress, my project is taking 10 days, one day to fit every door. On day two, I report that I completed two doors. The yeah. value of those doors will be 200. Yeah. So M value on its own may tell you nothing, but you use M value against the actual cost and your plan cost to see how well you're doing against schedule and how well you're doing in terms of your cost performance. When you report M value, you will know not only the value of the work that you deliver, but also how that compared to what we plan and how that compared to how much we actually spend. It's a very, very powerful tool. I love firm value. How do you represent that? It's quite a technical tool that a project manager may love and find very useful. But how do I communicate the the, the results of my uh, value analysis to, let's say, my sponsor or other stakeholders? That's a very good question. Your governance will also determine what is the best reporting matrix. Some projects maybe just use an Excel spreadsheet to provide end value values on the spreadsheet or maybe to do performance indexes. So they could do cost performance index, which is essentially your ratio between your end value and your actual cost, or maybe schedule performance indexes. Again, it's a ratio between your end value and and your plan cost. It shows how well you're doing on schedule. So you could do that on a spreadsheet. You could do that in a more visual way. You could represent that on your cost curve. We said when we establish your cost plan, you could do a cumulative cost Mm -hmm. curve. So you could plot your earn value on top of that cost curve, which gives you a visual indication. We're talking now about what's going on throughout our project life cycle as the money is being spent, as we we need to monitor uh, and report on our financial performance. When would we typically report progress against our budget on our project. So the financial performance of the project will be reported at different reviews. What those reviews are and the frequency will be established as part of the project governance. So typically, project will report at the various 
stages and gate reviews. Different organizations have different stage gates. They have different reporting periods, typically monthly. The message is, though, that we just need to do this frequently so that we're keeping on top of things. And if there is then any divergence or anything that we're not expecting, we're able to act upon that quickly rather than Absolutely. to go back to your runaway train rather than letting things go. Absolutely. Okay. And even if your organizational governance says we're reporting every month, the project manager should be on top of that. The project manager doesn't wait until day one of the next month and start looking at the cost every week. I'm sure everyone listening to us, if you work in big organizations, you'll have your reminder Friday afternoon, you know, before <laughs> four o'clock, please do your time sheet. So it's a really good practice that PM keeps on top every week. Just keep checking so there are no surprises. Yeah. That covers off learning outcome C, which is about knowing how to monitor and report financial performance. The final learning outcome then goes to the end of our project and it's about knowing how to close down the finances at the end of the project. What do I need to, to do at this point as the project manager? So at this point, hopefully the project have delivered all the work, the outputs have been completed. So now we need to close the project. Before we disband all the team, before we do the final financial report, we need to keep an eye and see if there are any outstanding payments because some invoices may take 30, mm -hmm. 60 days. Yeah. We need to make sure that everything is closed down in finance so people cannot book any more time to that project. There is a lot of work and is sometimes, again, it's underrated. The PM needs to make sure they are not pending claims, warranties before they do the final financial report because once the final financial report has been done, the project is formally closed, so nothing else can be booked on, on the project. There may be the case that the project is done really well and after the final financial report, we underspend. So anything not spent at that point can be reabsorbed back into the organization. This final report is really important to make sure that everything we need to deal with is being dealt with yeah. before the project is, is officially closing accounts. Yeah. First of all, you've got to prevent the ability to book anything else to the project once all of that work's done. But you still need to keep um, certain things open, maybe on the financial system. So those final invoices that have got longer payment terms are yes. able to be booked into the project so that everything is tied up neatly. Exactly. Yeah. Both cost internally and also external costs from third party suppliers. That's yeah. it. That was a really good review of budgeting and cost control. We've looked at how we create our budget in the first place using cost breakdown structure, identifying the different types of costs that would be included in the uh, the budget. And then, uh, Carmen, you told us about forecasting and refining budgets using earned value and how that can be helpful, particularly when we're monitoring and reporting financial performance throughout the project. And then finally, just making sure that we close down our finances at the end of a project, which is really important to make sure that that's done properly. That's been really interesting. Thank you very much, Carmen. No problem. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.